MA in Publishing. Um, yeah, welcome to MA in Publishing, One Road to a Career in Publishing, where we'll be talking all about um, working in publishing, um, things that you can do that could help your um, application or interview technique or general insights into the industry. And I've got um, three lovely panellists. I've got Avril Gray, um, who's Associate Professor in Publishing at Napier, Edinburgh Napier University. And then I've got Callie Simmons, who is Senior Recruitment Manager at HarperCollins. And also we have Julia Thompson, who is Senior HR um, Advisor at Bloomsbury. Um, sadly, we, we can't have Susie Asbury from Inspired Selection today, um, but we'll be talking a bit more about, um, about Inspired later on. Um, and information they have available. And, uh, and we've got quite a few attendees today, so I'm really pleased to hear that. And I hope you're all having a good Friday so far. Um, a couple of things that, just to say we're recording this session, and um, if you want to put questions in the chat box, and then at the end we'll have some time um, for questions. Um, and yeah, and I will, I'll just kick off with some of my own questions. Um, so the first one is, what, what one or two things could um, candidates do to stand out? Um, is there something they could start working on today? And if I could start with you, Callie, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So we're in a position at the moment where it, at, at the entry level for jobs in publishing, it is incredibly competitive with sort of lockdown. There were less jobs going last year with people sort of buttoning down the hatches as it were. And just being a bit more careful about hiring, it just means that we've got, there are more jobs out at the moment, but we've got sort of grads from last year, people who were job hunting last year that put it on hold, like it is very busy um, on the candidate front at the moment. Um, so yeah, I guess the important thing to think about is like, how can you stand out? Like I do find in applications that we get at HarperCollins, you do get, um, you know, CVs and cover letters and application forms that all look very similar. So I think, you know, with it being competitive, think about how you can stand out from the crowd. And I think that comes with sort of going that bit extra mile when it comes to your research, like doing research for each job, sort of not researching the industry as a whole, but thinking, you know, if you're applying for a job at Harper in a particular imprint, let's say it's Harper Collins Children's Books, you know, going in, like, what have they published in the last year? What did really well outside of David Williams and the obvious course? I think that layer of research just really shows that, you understand the market, you really thought about the job and what you can bring to it and thought about why that job in particular stands out to you. Um, and that comes from sort of being involved on in social media, sort of networking, trade press, like bookseller, um, checking out obviously the websites, but yeah, doing that extra layer of research, I think, and then getting that across in your application is something that, that really stands out to me when going through candidates for jobs. Um, so I think that's something that people could start working on today, just thinking about, you know, how could I make my research that give myself an edge over the other 20, 30, 40, maybe more people that are applying for this job as well. So it's quite obvious when people know the company or when they don't. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. And you do get um, like people are like, I don't know, I guess maybe it's sometimes harder to see sort of how the organisation's laid out for certain things, but like applying for a job at Farshaw, but then quoting books from HarperCollins children's books, like, you know what I mean, making it really specific to that individual role and showing that like, you really get it, you get the, the list, you get the authors and you get who they're trying to reach and the readers of that list. That's what I think that um, that's sort of step one, really. And, and you'd be surprised how many people don't even take their applications and their research that far. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good place to start. Great. And Avril, is there anything you wanted to add to this? Um, well, I really wanted to underline Callie's comment about research because it's something that we talk about a lot. Um, and the other thing that um, I try and encourage uh, applicants to do or our current students to do is to think about having a portfolio. Um, and you can do that from um, very early stages, even when you don't know what area you want to enter. You can think about um, researching some companies, but also pulling um, in from your own individual experience and how you can provide what I like to call proof statements, which uh, link directly to the job application. Um, so not only have you done the research uh, and you understand exactly what the company requires, but then you can draw from your own experience um, those proof statements that evidence um, your skill set in those areas. That's really interesting. So that will be useful for um, applications, but obviously interviews as well. 
um, yeah. Uh, Julia, um, did, did you have anything to add about um, things that one or two things that applicants could do today to help them stand out? Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, so, yeah, I um, I would definitely agree with um, with what Callie and Avril have said. You know, um, it is really quite surprising the amount of applications that we'll get where, you know, you'd get a CV and then you get the cover letter and the cover letter is just quite generic and it's just sort of saying the same thing as what your CV says. Um, so I would really use the cover letter as the opportunity to show a bit of your personality um, tell us what specifically, um, yeah, about the role you're drawn to. You know, if you could pick out a specific title uh, from one of the lists that you know you're passionate about, great. Um, and yeah, just echoing the um, what Callie said about doing your research. You know, go to the uh, publisher's website, read up. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that um, yeah, bring a bit of your own personality to to the cover letter because that you know that. For me, that does make an application stand out. And um, Julia, is there is there something that tends to be the, the area that candidates fall down on the most? Um, yeah, I would say probably the generic application. So, um, you know, uh, where somebody is, and it is totally understandable because, um, you know, you have to apply for a lot of jobs. I get it. It's really, it's really competitive. Um, but making your cover letter tailored to the specific role that you're applying for um, is so important because, yeah, just sending a generic letter when you've got hundreds of applications to go through, um, I would say that is probably where people do fall down. Yeah, yeah. It's very obvious when someone's written a cover letter and sent it to say five publishers that you can tell if it's just, you know, like a generic, I want to get into books, this is why. But yeah, yeah not having thought about what Bloomsbury books that really stood out to you and which authors and, you know, why this type of job, why editorial, why production, why marketing, you know, why does that particular role speak to your strengths? Why does it align? Um, there was something I did a careers clinic a few uh, months ago we sort of split a cover letter into <laughs> the three c's everyone loves a <laughs> bit of what's the word alliteration so it was um competencies so what can you um what experience can you bring to the role so is that like administrative experience you know have you worked in teams have you organized clubs or societies like what can you actually bring and do from the get-go um, the next one was, so it was competencies, curiosity. So why are you curious about this job, this role, this imprint, these authors, these books? Um, and the last one was uh, competency. So that's the, when you bring in sort of the skills and what makes your CV slightly different. And that can be, you know, I've got excellent research or, you know, I'm really good um, in the high pressure. I'm a great problem solver, that sort of thing. So I found that's a quite a good way of breaking it down where you cover the three different elements of the role. That's great, yeah. So three, the three C's. So we've three got, that's brilliant. Curiosity, competency, and sorry, what Cap was the first one? Capabilities. Capability. Yeah, great. Um, what What are your thoughts on this, Avril? Is there one area that you think always comes up as a problem? Um, this might sound really basic, um, but I think that one of the big things is that people don't apply. I think the lack of confidence, and you could add that to your C's, Carly. The company, yeah. <laughs> um, to make sure that you don't close the door on yourself. Um, and I think that that's so important. I mean, time and time again, I see really able, competent students um, thinking that they can't do the job. And I know they can. And it's just, uh, you know, just having that belief in yourself. Because I have to say, uh, the person perhaps who gets the job may not be as competent as you may not stand out in all those three C's as you, but they've applied. And so falling down at the first hurdle, I think, of not applying, um, I, I would suggest that uh, bolster your confidence uh, and, uh, and apply for those jobs. Um, because not only will it help you if you don't uh, succeed, um, but it will give you that practice for when that job um, that's perfect for you comes along. And because you'll be more experienced, you'll have learned from your failures and, and you'll succeed uh, in getting that job. Uh, that's my um that's that's my take on that that's what I try and encourage all our students to do from day one mm -hmm. and 
Avril, are there any standout um, applications or applicants that you can remember from recent years? And was there anything that really sort of stuck in your mind for what made them special? Well, I'm looking at it from a, a different perspective because obviously I'm um, suggesting that students go out and apply to publishers. Um, but I come from industry myself. Um, and so when I started in academia, one of the things I took in was um, practical uh, publishing. Um, and, and I think that the, the students that stand out and that um, I uh, would suggest that uh, shine are those students that get involved. And so I loved Callie's um, Sea of Curious um, because those people who um, are brave enough to ask questions, are brave enough to take a risk, um, to embrace a challenge, uh, those are the individuals that, that really would stand out. And, and those are the ones um, that um, when you're talking about personality in a covering letter, um, they, they then can invest that into that written application because they've tested themselves all through the year um, and um, they've been able to provide those proof statements when it comes to an application. I don't know if that really answers your question, um, but that, that's certainly what stands out for me as a student. And then I'm, I'm never really surprised when those individuals get the job. Um, because all through the year they've demonstrated um, and it's not just about ability it's about that curiosity that Callie was talking about and that confidence um, and the embracing the opportunities. Julia are there any standout um, applications or applicants that you can remember that yeah recently? Yes yeah uh, so actually in the last sort of uh, what was, I think it's about April time and um, we did because of the pandemic we did a group interview and um, I there was a specific candidate who actually didn't have any experience um, in publishing and was from a finance background, actually, but was just so passionate. And um, I think she spoke about um, one of our authors, Sarah Jane Matz, um, and had some brilliant ideas, was really creative. Um, and you could just see how passionate she was. And she actually ended up getting the role. So... Um, yeah, I would say that um, that particular person, it was an editorial assistant position as well, which is, you know, coveted. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was probably one of the uh, recent ones that really stood out. And that's interesting. So she came to you with ideas and that, yeah. and that really showed how invested and creative she was. Yeah, yeah. She'd, re she'd obviously really thought about, about it before, uh, before the interview, so... Ali, do you have any that you can remember from recent years that particularly stand out? There was, um, it wasn't an application actually, it was, they, it was for an interview where we had someone who was interviewing for Borough Press, um, imprints within Harper Fiction, and the candidate had, this was before lockdown, so it was in the office, and they turned up to the interview. Um, it actually kind of relates to what Avril was saying about portfolios. Where they, they'd come up, they'd basically like researched Borough Press, thought about who the readership were, and looked at the books that were on our list that we published in the last sort of six months. And they came along to the interview with a list of books from like the bestsellers list on like the top 50 or whatever. And so that these are books that I think would have worked really well within Borough Press. And it just really showed that they got it. They got what the message was, you know, who the readers were, the types of books that work well in their mantra there and it was brilliant I'd never I've never I've mentioned this a few times I've never seen anyone do it since I've never seen anyone do it before and it was just um it was just bringing something a bit different to the interview sort of that, that stand out and thinking outside the box getting a bit creative with it and it was really impressive and, and they did ultimately end up getting the job um it was an editorial position but yeah and things like when in app on the application side like when people you know put the link to their their bookstagram or their book talk or their book blog or you know showing that you're involved in the community and invested in publishing and you know are doing your research getting those insights and I mean that that's definitely a standout thing as well and that that's interesting that you mentioned community um, that leads us on to our next question which is how important do you think social media is you could start with that Kelly um I mean, obviously it's like Twitter's a huge channel in publishing, like the authors use it, our publicists are on it, all the marketers and editors, like it is, that is like the main channel from what I can see where, you know, people connect and network and share information and content. 
So, I mean, I think it makes sense to get on Twitter. Like even if you start a separate account that's just for your publishing life, books life. Um, I know I've done that like for from working in publishing yeah. and, you know, following your favorite authors and your favorite imprints, like then you're going to get sort of that more specific feed, aren't you, of jobs that are going to be more relevant to you and align with your tastes and, and the books that you're really passionate about. So I think, and it's, yeah, you can like connect with authors, connect with people who work in publishing, you know, ask for a call. People in publishing tend to be very nice. Um, so yeah, I mean, and I've, I've had people before, like just message me on Twitter and say, can I have a chat? I just want some tips on like how I can, you know, find more jobs or where to look and, you know, and that's and most of the time people are very happy to do that. So I definitely think that's a good place to start. And obviously, like I said, with like book talk taking off and bookstagrams are ever popular. I think over lockdown, lots of people started social media channels like that. So it's a great way of getting insights and again, yeah, getting involved and feeling like you're getting part of the industry before you work in it is just a great stepping stone, I think, and building that knowledge and understanding of how the industry works. And that's a really good point as well about reaching out to people, because I think often people feel shy. And I suppose it comes back to your point, Avril, about confidence. Um, but it is often just worth getting in touch and seeing if people have time because often people are very happy to help. Definitely. Like, what have you got to lose? Like they, if they don't reply, then try someone else. Like yes. if you're making a connection and getting some tips that someone else hasn't got, then you're going to stand out and you're going to have an edge. Exactly. Um, yeah. What, what are your thoughts on this, Avril, around um, social media and, and engaging with the community in this way? Well, I think it's it's really important, um, especially when you're just starting out and when you're learning and you're thinking about making those all important networks and connections. Um, however, I, I do understand that um, it can be daunting uh, for individuals, you know, um, it, it, Twitter is really important as LinkedIn is. There's lots of uh, there's lots of ways to get in touch. Um, but what I would suggest is that um, even if you might not be have the confidence to ask the questions, you can absolutely start off by listening and engaging with the conversation. Um, so that's the first point. And then the second point I would say is to remember that when you are on social media, that um, that, that will be part of your application. I think Julia mentioned um, your personality coming through. Well, publishers will look there to see if they can find out more about you. So treat your social media um, as a strategic um, tool in your application process. Get your house in order. Make sure that what you're presenting to the publishers is what you want them to see. Um, and then, as I said, you know, you can engage with the conversation until you um, find your place, find your tribe, find your community uh, and build those all important networks. And, and I absolutely agree. Ask talk to people, um, they will you'll invariably want to help you. They may be very busy, but if you give them a, a chance and um, explain that you know, you're know you not gonna take up three days of their time, um, you'll plan that uh, discussion with them as you would with any professional, give them a chance to help you and, and talk to you and engage with you. And invariably, I think they will. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um... And yeah, also worth remembering with uh, Twitter and social media that if you're using it for professional purposes, try and keep it professional, you know, friendly. And But uh, it's very easy sometimes to forget how many people are on social media. Um, and yeah, and, um, and Julia, what, what are your thoughts on social media in this, uh, in this regard? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, sort of core of publishing really is about making connections. So um, social media for that purpose is, is great. Um, and it's also a really great way of sort of keeping up to date with, um, you know, changes in the marketplace. Um, you know, if you're, if you're following all of your uh, your favourite authors, your favourite publishers, you can keep abreast of, um, you know, their new releases, new campaigns. Um, and um, actually, um one of we've just published a book um called poppy cooks i don't know if anyone's interested in cooking but um poppy o'toole so she was um a michelin uh trained chef and she lost her job in the pandemic and she started making cook cookery videos on tiktok mm. i i don't really know much about tiktok i'm a bit old but um yeah so um we've actually published a book off the back of that so um you know you know shows what a big impact um you know it, it can have really so 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I would say get on there and yeah, like what Callie was saying as well, you know, following your uh, your favourite imprints and things. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in terms of us engaging with the community in a slightly different way, um, Callie, what, what are your thoughts about um, in-person networking and events and things like that? Obviously, there, you know, the last 18 months, there hasn't been so much of that. But uh, I think there's often a, I think there's often a sense that people need to go to lots of events and network and be quite extrovert to work in certain areas of publishing. Um, and I wonder what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this has come up a few times actually around this the extrovert versus introvert thing. And I think um, everyone's a bit of both, aren't they? Like I don't think you need to be an extrovert all the time in interviews and assessments and you know be shouting in people's faces all the time about how much you love books because it's just a bit much but I think it's just about like if you are more introverted as a person I think it's just about like being able to dial it up when you need to like obviously if you were like if you were in a job in sales and you were meeting with a customer to pitch the list that you were going to sell to Waterstones or whatever or you know meeting an author for the first time building a relationship yeah you need to be able to dial it up and you know build a rapport and keep the energy up and things like that but also there are times when being an introvert, getting your head down, focus, taking more of a measured approach really works. And I think that works in events as well. Sort of taking taking a step back, like scanning the room, like, hey, who can I speak to? Who's going to be a good connection for me? Um, I think there's really something to that. Um, I mean, in-person events, there's, well, there's definitely value to events. I mean, there's a, a value in coming to events like this that are virtual, right? It's all about it, getting insights, learning more about this industry that you're looking to break into building connections, learning more about what's going on, what are the trends, what are the changes in consumer buyer habits, you know, what are people reading now, how is the way people find books changing, like all that's the, that's the sort of stuff you pick up at these events and events like and the literary events and author events, so I think it's great if you can go to them, I, I, yeah, I think that you definitely should, and if you can wangle that into a cover letter or a CV to show that you're, you're doing that, then I think that's that's even better like shout about it like again like be confident don't be scared to just show off a bit about like no I did go to four events last month actually they were all about books and that's why I'm applying for this because I want to do that as a full-time job you know so yeah I think there's a lot of value in in that. Great and um and Avril what, what are your thoughts on this and <laughs> do you have any advice for people who, who perhaps find in-person networking quite scary? Well, the whole idea of networking, which is a yeah, <laughs> quite a difficult, uh, it's a bit of a contentious pr- uh, word, I think. I, I think you're right. I think, I, well, I don't know. I have not found many people who love networking, <laughs> um, but I have found lots of people who love talking to other people who love books. And, and I think that um, having, changing the, you know, the sense of the word perhaps might help. So just think about it as having a conversation. And part of this webinar today was, was uh, focused on, on uh, individuals who have perhaps uh, achieved or are achieving their MA in publishing. And what I always like to say to our students is that you already have a community together um, and, and you can encourage each other. You know, you can um, build up a group of people uh, and to all go to an event uh, and then, you know, uh, challenge each other to go and speak to that person that you want to speak to and then have that supportive group to come back to if uh, you know if things go well that's brilliant but also have that you know uh, encouragement if, if it doesn't go quite as well as you anticipate but it's like everything else I think you need to practice it I mean I, I will confess here I don't really like networking but um, I love talking to people um, and when you go to one event, then you've met someone that you might see at another event, and then you build it up. So practice it and build your own communities. That's what I would say um, to help you um, manage <laughs> uh, networking um, and think about it in, a, in its all its glorious forms, if you like, um, because it's not just about um, going off to a big, um, large uh, event, but it's also attending these smaller events as well. And, um, and, and you have to, you'll, you'll probably find that publishing is a small industry and you'll see the same people over and over again, which is lovely and encouraging um, and it'll take time. So don't be too hard on yourself. You don't have to be brilliant at the first event, um, but you can practice it uh, and, and that will help you as well. Does that help? Hopefully. That's really helpful. 
And, and Julia, do you have any words of wisdom on events and um, in-person networking or speaking to people? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think events and, and networking are a big, they are a big part of, of publishing. You know, there's a, I think, um, drinking warm white wine, at, um, you know, um, <laughs> events and things like that. that um, but I don't think that you um, necessarily need to be an extrovert to, to network. Um, you know, it's about making connections, really. So, um, and yeah, you don't have to be an extra to make, uh, sorry, extrovert to make connections with people. Um, and there are different ways of networking. Um, I'll give you an example. So um, we've got um, a, 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 someone that works in an entry level role in our art department. Um, and she's actually really shy um, and a definite introvert. Um, she made a PowerPoint presentation for um, how to present to people that have got perhaps like learning uh, disabilities. So she's dyslexic herself. And so she made this PowerPoint presentation about how um, you can present to people that have got dyslexia, uh, colour blindness, that sort of thing. She sent it to us and then it ended up actually being sent to the whole of the company. And so, she, you know, she's managed to network with people across the whole of the company. Um, and she's definitely, you know, not an extrovert. But, and so there's different ways that you can network, I think, you know, thinking outside the box. Yeah. Also with them getting involved in the groups and community the network and the groups that put on the events can be another angle to it because that's a good way of people just sort of rather than having to outwardly network people come to you because you're the one like society of young publishers put on quite a lot of events um, and there's other groups um and communities that do do similar things like I've done a few um like careers events things for so yeah I think and I think a lot of those are mentioned in the book set don't they and, and again on Twitter if you follow the right hashtags to do with like publishing hopefuls or that's the one at the moment isn't it or like get into publishing so yeah, if you if, if if you find the events a bit scary, about because I know I hate going up to people and being like, "Hi, do you want to talk about books for a bit?" It is quite awkward and weird. But if you're the one organising it, then you've sort of already got that hook, and you can already be like, "Oh, how did you join the event today? Like, what do you do? You know what I mean? Like, I think there's um, different ways to approach it depending on what you're most comfortable with. And obviously, virtual events are easy as well because you can just stick your hand up or put a comment in the chat, still get that information without having to, yeah. <laughs> feel too awkward <laughs> <laughs> um yes i i think that's a really good point and um i think at this at this point i would just like to flag some bookseller plugs uh, which i i feel obliged to mention um so we've we've mentioned quite a bit about research and engaging with the community um and one good way of uh keeping up to date is registering for the morning bulletin which comes each day um, and another really good offer that we've got at the moment is that students can pay just £39 for a full year's subscription, which is usually £168 for a digital subscription. Um, and the promo code is student deal in capitals at the checkout. Um, and that's also in the, uh, in the chat box. So um, these will be really good ways of keeping in touch with people, with industry, keeping tabs on what's going on, events, things like that. Um, and now I would like to touch on um, how the application process is changing. So do you have thoughts on this, Callie, about how the application process is changing? Yeah, sure. So I know that we've definitely had a big change in how we take applications for our vacancies. So HarperCollins, we use a blind recruitment platform so rather than candidates being screened based on their CV and a cover letter, we set some bespoke application questions that are related to the job. So based on the skills that that job needs, and then candidates answer those questions and they're blind reviewed by the, the hiring team for that particular role. Um, so again, this is why I think why I keep pushing the research thing, because we're, we're asking specific questions about skills and knowledge and understanding that we want to see in this person who's going to get this job. And we do try to make sure that those questions are as close to the actual tasks in the job as possible and more about what would you do if in this situation rather than tell me a time when so like for entry level it's not all about who's done four internships it's more about thinking about what have you done that's transferable and how can you apply it to this job and that could be anything from you know working in a shop and building up customer service skills 
to working in a restaurant and dealing with tricky customers and you know having to juggle five different things at once and manage five or six you know what I mean or you know maybe you have done some work in a for a charity or anything and you've got some admin experience and you so yeah I think so the, ours has shifted a lot in in that we we're focused on skills and strengths and what you can do in a role rather than who's got the longest CV so that's obviously a huge shift for us um yeah does anyone else want to, I don't want to take so too much and steal all the <laughs> good all the points Julia do you have uh, do you have thoughts on this you said Julia then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah sorry um yeah um we have um been focusing on diversifying our recruitment process so um we've been looking at where we advertise our roles and um, we've also reviewed and updated our entry level uh, job descriptions so sort of um, linking back to what Avril was saying before about being confident to apply for jobs um, you know we sort of looked at our job descriptions um, especially for entry level positions and sort of thought well actually these might be a bit uh, intimidating to people that you know you're just coming into the publishing industry you were applying for your first job and it's asking for experience it's asking for you to have excellent this and excellent that so um yeah we've looked at some of the language in our job descriptions and um and changed that um and yeah just um you know trying to make it more appealing to a wider variety of people um you know and making it clear that you don't necessarily need to have experience um, before you know working in publishing before you apply for these roles we're interested in people's passion and um you know uh, what what you're interested in and like i was saying before about showing us your personality so um yeah i would say those things is what we've um what we've changed what we're continuing to change avril do you have any thoughts from a more academic perspective on how you see um companies are changing their application processes? I think uh, the application process now is, is much more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. So it allows opportunities for people to uh, demonstrate their skills in various different ways. And as Callie was saying, it doesn't have to be just in, in, in writing uh, the, the traditional CV and covering letter. Um, but we're also seeing that um, publishers will be asking for video applications, which again is great to see. Um, because it allows those individuals um, to shine in that arena if they're confident in that way. Um, but on the flip side of that, it doesn't work for everyone. So from an academic point of view, what we try to do is to try and encourage people to participate in a number of different um, modes and platforms in order to be able to um, apply for as many jobs as possible. What would be lovely if publishers would uh, provide uh, an alternative route so it doesn't have to be one thing or the other. Um, and it's great to see that inclusion and diversity is, is really being considered. Uh, and, and a lot of really brilliant work has been happening in a very short period of time. Um, so I would just say that it's um, important for people to look at all the different ways that um, their application uh, can be tailored to the job um, and then to think about how they can best display those skills within the parameters of the job application and, and one thing I would just say is and, and this is, is, is a little bit of a mantra for me but just read the instructions of the job uh, and think very carefully about the wording that's being used and, and to how then that it can link directly to what you're intending to apply for. So that um, when you are faced with a variety of different um, ways that you can apply, that you're prepped for all of those ways. Does that make sense? Definitely, yeah. Um, and actually something that I've, I've found um, going, going forward in my career that didn't occur to me earlier on is just thinking a bit about, yeah, scenarios that the, you know, the companies might ask for and ways that I might have demonstrated some initiative or creativity in the past. And I think like Callie, you mentioned, it doesn't have to be directly related to the industry. It can sometimes be, um, you know, quite tangential, but it's just worth thinking about, isn't it? Like what scenarios could, could come up in this job that I can, I can show my capability for. Um, 
so yeah and just just planning that a little bit um and um and another thing that i'm interested in is um how easy it is to transfer across departments and whether candidates should try and enter publishing um with a view to moving across to their desired department um perhaps if they they try and enter a, a team where there's more space or, or something like that or, or would you really recommend just holding out for the the job you're most interested in in the department you're most interested in um julia right i don't know if you have any thoughts on this yeah and um, i mean i would say first of all um i i would always say to apply for a role that you really want um you know and you think that you can progress in because if you're just sort of applying for a role that you know oh i'm not really interested in it but i want to get into publishing i think it would show yeah um so but I, that's not necessarily to say that you can't transfer um and actually i think one of the great things about doing an ma in publishing is that you're going to get the exposure to lots of different areas lots of different disciplines within publishing that might make you consider roles in different areas. You know, you might go into it thinking, no, I, I want to work in editorial, but by the end of your course, you might think, oh, well, actually I'm, you know, perhaps thinking that I might be better suited to marketing or, I don't know, rights or something. Um, so, yeah, but I would always say, go for a role that you really want to do, you know, that you're interested in. Um, that would be my advice. <laughs> Callie, what, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with Julia and that you shouldn't apply for something if you don't think you're really going to be able to do it and get into it and feel passionately about the work that you're doing. I guess at the same time, there is a real bottleneck when it comes to everyone wants a job in editorial. And that isn't the only job in publishing where you get to work closely with books and authors and customers and you know the, the readers. And I think there's a couple of role like verticals that go that are a little bit sort of fly under the radar, like sales, for example. Like it's a brilliant role to get into publishing, learn about how the commercial side works, how, how customers buy books, why they buy books, what types of books. You know, and you do also get involved in stuff with authors, like as you work up in sales, you're actually involved in the acquisition process and we're, we're looking to buy new manuscripts to then come in and publish like it's so involved in the whole process and I think sales is yeah is really underestimated as, as, a, as a job in publishing. I think people think that it's like a door to door salesperson, but when it's really not it's so much more involved than that. So yeah I think I, I agree yeah for sure only apply for jobs if you if you're really into them and you feel like you know you're going to enjoy it but at the same time like do your research and look at what other jobs there are like there's loads of resources out there like on I think the books that I have a page about like different verticals in publishing as of the publishing association we've got some stuff on our website like figure out what your strengths are and because I know there's plenty of people who um are like working different divisions like in our production team and publicity for example who started out like no I only want to do editorial and then they did a little bit in editorial in internship or work experience and actually like Mm, so if it's for me I want to I want to be a bit more you know working with the customers or you know out there at events whereas you know the editorial team don't always get as involved in that sort of thing so I think keep your options open do your research and, and look at those other jobs and don't just pigeonhole yourself um but yeah make sure you've done your research before you apply um because yeah as Julia said it does you can tell if someone's just sort of sprayed their CV across like a whole list of jobs and um haven't really thought about it in as much, like we say about done the research and really thought about how their skills are well lended to that job. So yeah. Does that help? That's really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And um Avril, did you want did you have any comments on on this one? Yeah, I, I did because I, I wanted to agree with um, Callie and Julian. It's really encouraging to hear that from the industry because that's something that we talk about a lot uh, during the course of our um, master's degree. Um, and one of the things we also say is that, you know, not all uh, publishers are the same. So you might have a smaller publisher where their rules are not so uh, divided. Um, and therefore, you know, if you really want to work with that publisher, it may be that you do um, apply for a job that's maybe not your ideal job, but it is a way in uh, through the door and then progression through that publisher um, might be what you want. Um, but similarly, 
it might be that you find that you actually excel in that role. Uh, and it, it, you know, if you don't try, you will never find that out. I've had many students who've thought like um, Callie was saying about sales, they didn't think that sales was for them, but they really loved, they thrived on the, the, you know, the buzz of, of, of securing a sale. And, and they, you know, they found that their personality worked really well in, in, in that role. So I would suggest, yes, absolutely. Don't apply for things that you, you, know, you definitely don't want, um, but do think outside the box do uh, consider how you're going to get into that publishing house if that's the house that you really want to work for it'll come across as your cv um, if the role is there um, you know apply for it because i have to say it might not uh, you know that job might not appear with that house uh, for some time um, and, and you know it's no point in waiting for the perfect job because it it, it might never come That's, yeah, that's very, uh, very wise, I think. Um, and yeah, just to say that we're, we've probably got about another 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, and I've got a couple more questions, but we just, we've had a really interesting question that's come in from George Stephen. He says, thanks for the tip so far, very useful. You've talked a lot about entry level roles. For students on an MA, I wondered if you could share any tips on gaining placements or internships and the process of reaching out to publishers organizations without a prescribed role advertised so that's a really interesting one um callie did you want to start with this yeah sure um so tips on placements and internships I mean, well, first things first, I just want to say that please don't apply for internships that aren't paid because they should be just as a word to the wise. Um, it is work and it should be at least sort of London living wage, national living wage, just minor caveat. Um, I mean, I, I know that we, we post all of our internships in the same way we post our entry level jobs and that they go on our, our website and our Twitter. Um, LinkedIn's a great place to look. The trade press, obviously the job boards within the publishing industry are a good place to look. I mean, work experience for us definitely tapered off a bit over lockdown because we used to host it in the office. We did in place of that do our learning days, which we are actually launching again, hopefully a bit later on this year, which is like a day session. You can sit in on a publishing meeting, meet some like marketing directors and editorial directors and find out a bit more about how it all sort of demystifying publishing and figuring out how it all fits together, which would be something you could put on your CV. So, I mean, that's that's a good place to start. Um, I'm hoping, I mean, it's definitely picking up now. There's more, I've got more, I've got a lot of vacancies on at the moment. So I think, and I've, I think that's reflected with the, the whole market that there are gonna be more opportunities opening up um, as we go forward. Now things are, feel like they're getting to a bit more normal in terms of, yeah, what we've been through the last 18 months. So, yeah, I mean, th those are the places that I would look. And again, by, by being active on social media and getting involved in the networks and communities that are all about publishing and starting out your career. I mean, if you're engaged with those, then like I said, you're more likely to come across the opportunities. But I, I think I just want to also say that I don't think you have to do an internship to get a job in publishing. Like we said before, like working in other industries, just building general work experience, that's still transferable skills. If you can demonstrate that you're passionate about books and getting into this work um, with a little bit of work experience in, it, in any form, there's always going to be something you can pull up. So don't feel like you have to get an internship before you can start applying. I just don't think that's the case. That's, that's really helpful. That was going to be one of my questions actually, was do you have to have you know, an internship or something under your belt before applying? The job so that's really welcome yeah in part that's why we do the blind recruitment now because before I think people focus way too much on what was on your CV and not about how you can demonstrate the skills and knowledge and research and the passion for the books so by removing that and just focusing on these questions that we set it means that everyone's sort of being assessed on a on a, the same a level playing field and mm -hmm. you don't have biases around oh they've done an internship at Penguin so they must be great because it doesn't necessarily mean you're great because you know what I mean but someone who's been you know, attending events and go like we like doing all the stuff that we've just been talking about around like engagement and networking and has like some administrative experience could be ten times as good as that in person who's done it. Do you know what I mean? So think about it in, in that way as well. Mm -hmm. And um, Julia, did you want to add anything? 
really have anything to add. I think Callie said that, you know, I just, to I totally agree. I don't think it's, I think when we were talking before about how things are changing, I think maybe in the past it was the sort of, you know, the route was, oh, I'll go and do a work experience placement or an internship and then I get, you know, move up to a, uh, assistant level. But I don't think that's the case so much now. It, you know, um, you, you don't need to have an internship or a work experience placement to apply for an entry level position. So I'd say go for it, <laughs> go for entry level. <laughs> Avril, do you have anything you wanted to add on this? Yeah, just quickly, if that's okay. Um, we do have a placement as part of our master's programme, and I know a number of other institutions who offer publishing also have uh, one. And I'll just, if in case we run out of time, I'll just put a shout out here uh, for the Association for Publishing Education. Um, that is an organisation that represents all institutions that offer publishing um, as a postgraduate or undergraduate degree. Um, and um, most of the people maybe here today are maybe on one of those uh, programmes. So what I would suggest to you is, uh, is to reach out to your staff, your academic uh, uh, support, um, but also if you have a careers service as well, because you will find that a number of institutions and universities will help you with that. Um, it is, uh, as Callie and Julia said, uh, something that uh, is less important, but in a competitive um, environment, it's understandable that individuals feel that they, they need that. Um, so support is there um, from your institutions, um, and you can do a lot by treating uh, your application to a placement uh, like an application for a job. And we've talked a lot about how that, you know, you can apply for jobs today. So as I said, time is of the essence, so I don't want to dwell too much on that, but hopefully that helps. Thank you very much. And um, Julia, I wanted to go back to you on something that you, you've touched on. Um, and it's a question that says, is editorial assistant the best place to start in terms of applications when looking to begin a career? Or as I have already experienced with my own small publishing business and an MA in publishing, is there a different first step? Wondered what your thoughts were. Um, no, editorial assistant definitely isn't like the only um, starting point. There are lots of different types of entry level role um, in publishing. You know, uh, Callie mentioned uh, the sales. So, you know, sales assistant, marketing assistant, rights assistant, contracts assistant. Um, yeah, I, if you've got already got experience working in publishing, um, you know, I mean, I, it's difficult to say without knowing like how long you've done it and uh, what processes you've been involved in. But, um, you know, there are also then the next level up, you know, like as assistant editor or, um, you know, um, sort of entry to mid level positions. So, by no means is editorial assistant the only uh, starting point, no. We sometimes have um, executive as our entry level title as well. So sales executive, marketing executives, that could be a good one to look out for. Um, also publishing assistant is one that we have in a few divisions, another one to put on your list for LinkedIn and Googling. And Callie, I've got another question um, for you. Sorry, could I just interrupt? Um, I'm so sorry, but I was really interested in the fact that that question mentioned that they had their own small publishing business. And I would suggest that that's a real asset. Um, a lot of people shy away from the finance um, and the legalities that surround publishing. And if you have experience in running your own business, then that, that I would suggest that there's a, that is a unique selling point that, that you might bring to a job. Um, so that's one thing. And, and secondly, if you've any of you who have done an MA here or an MSc, which is what we offer, but a master's in publishing, actually, you might want to think about uh, applying for jobs above an entry level role or an assistant role. So, like I said earlier, um, have the confidence to apply and don't undervalue or close the door on, on applying for jobs that you might feel that are above you, because they're probably not. And Avril, you, um, you talked a bit about um, the portfolio earlier, and I, I just wondered, we've had a question um, that says, does having a portfolio play an important role even while applying for a beginner level role or an internship in the editorial department specifically? Okay, so uh, let's dissect the word portfolio. 
Um, by that, I mean having a number of ways that you can demonstrate your experience. Um, and if you're just starting out, obviously, um, that might be limited to um, either the work that you'd undertaken in your studies um, or uh, from your private uh, and personal life. Um, but what always surprises me that um, when I'm reviewing students' CVs uh, and applications is that they forget to mention all the brilliant work that they've done in their a master's degree. So they might not say that they've proofread a book, they might not say that they've created a, a publishing a publicity campaign, they just say the title of their degree and the date that they uh, acquired it. And that gives, uh, I would imagine, uh, recruitment agents um, and uh, HR departments very little to go on. So remember that you've spent a year of your lives invested in publishing and bring out all of those elements into let's call it a portfolio but really it's just a list of all of the wonderful things that you've been able to to achieve over which is quite sometimes an intensive year um, and, and that will shine through because you've invested a year of your lives in into uh, trying to get a job in publishing and you know bring that that effort and those achievements out. Thank you very much. That's really useful. And um, Callie, I had a, a question for you that's come through, um, which is, I'm currently doing my post graduation and it will end in September 2022. When should I start looking for jobs? Um, I could know, I guess it depends if it's a part time course, then you could potentially start looking now like there are fixed term contracts there's part-time jobs that come up that might work with your schedule if you're keen to get going sooner rather than later and um, if you're in a full-time course and we're looking for full-time work from next year I probably start having a look around in the summer like most companies are happy to wait notice periods or you know a couple of months um in most instances so I'd probably start looking in the summertime just so you don't miss out and um yeah seeing how you go from there that would probably be my approach um julia did you want to say anything on this or has it been covered already yeah i think i think callie's covered it yeah i would agree with what callie said yeah great and uh and oh yeah Afro, did you want to add anything or no i think it's all covered thank you great and I, yeah, I feel that I would like to mention um, just a bit of information about um, inspired selection, because as we said earlier, Susie isn't able to be here today, but she did say that inspired selection is always keen to hear from publishing hopefuls. Um, and there's lots of information on her website. Um, so do get in touch with um, inspired selection um, if, if you're interested in pursuing publishing as a career. And, um, and yeah, we've got another interesting question here about, is there an etiquette when it comes to applying again to companies where you have previously applied but been unsuccessful? I wouldn't want to feel like I would be handing the company, but obviously as you gain more experience, you might be more suited to the role next time round. Um, Julia, did you have anything you wanted to say on this? Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, for for me, um, if somebody was applying, it, it depends really. If you're applying for the same role, then no, uh, you know, go for it. Yeah, I would say that there's not, um, there's nothing stopping you from applying again for that role. Um, yeah, like you say, you might have more experience the next time you go for it. I suppose one thing is that if you're applying for like every single role, <laughs> entry level role, um, uh, you know, and we see the same name come up for, I don't know. You know, however many roles they're applying for in lots of different areas I mean there isn't an etiquette for that but you know it might show that you know like we were talking before about spraying your CV around everywhere it, um yeah but no there isn't an etiquette <laughs> <Awkward answers. laughs> but no there isn't an etiquette but just be I would say just be mindful of how many roles you're applying for with the same publisher because it's probably going to be seen by the same <laughs> Callie, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I definitely, obviously, if as long as you're tailoring your application and you're thinking about how your skills are related to that role and the experience that you can bring, I mean, I would 
maybe disagree slightly and th I think you can apply for as many as you want and I know like maybe it's different because of the way we screen candidates because I can't see if someone's applied for all the roles because we use a blind platform so if someone's applied for every job I have I'm not really going to know <laughs> there isn't a way that it flags it so maybe if it's more if they're doing direct applications to you Julia then I would see you would see the name over and over so yeah that's I'm just I can see that but from our yeah I, I think it's it's so competitive and if there are more jobs going I wouldn't hold back like why not it's another chance that you might get an interview or might make a new connection or might even get some feedback about how you can improve your application next time so I think go for it but just make sure you're yeah doing your research and, and not just spraying a generic cover letter and cv like what tailoring it to each individual because every job's going to be different because it's going to be working with different authors it's going to be in a different team it's going to be in a different imprint different part of the business so it's important that it's bespoke but i think just go for it <laughs> i i think that's a, a theme that's uh, coming out from today is to yeah have confidence go for it do your research um, know how you can present your, you know, your skills and experience and th think creatively about that. So, yeah, I feel like this is very encouraging. Uh, we've got, yeah, some, some more great questions coming through. Uh, this for Avril, um, do you think a publishing MA is more important for people wanting to enter the industry in Scotland? There are two renowned courses here and not as many work experience opportunities. I think it would be helpful for networking. Okay, so um, I don't think a publishing master's degree is any more important in Scotland than it is uh, in the UK. Um, the thing is, we get students, uh, and I know this is the case for Sterling as well, we get students from across uh, the UK and internationally. Uh, some of those individuals want to work in Scotland and some of them want to work um, in, across the UK or abroad. So really, I think the thing is that you have to decide for yourself whether the publishing MA or MSc is, is valuable to you. It's neither, you know, I don't think publishing, well, I know publishing companies in Scotland uh, don't think um, any differently from a master's degree wherever you might uh, secure it. Great. And um, Julia, I've got a question that I wanted to put to you here. And it says, how about people doing a Masters of Arts? Is it possible for them to pursue a portfolio to facilitate the entry in the publishing field? Oh, sorry, I was on mute there. Um, so, sorry, so somebody applying for like a, a role in art or design? Not um, I think it was, um, how relevant is it for someone to do a Masters in, in Arts generally? as opposed to publishing specifically. Um, oh, right, okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think, again, you know, with the fact that we're trying to make um, it more inclusive uh, as a, an industry, I don't think that it would necessarily um, uh, be more important. I mean, obviously, go, doing an MA in publishing, you're going to get um, the exposure to the different um, disciplines uh, within within publishing, so you get sort of sort of to try it out if you like before you're uh, you're applying. You're getting a little bit more exposure, but I don't think that that would um, hinder you if you're doing a, a, a master of arts over over publishing. Um, and yeah, I, I don't yeah I don't really have anything else to add to that. Does anyone else have anything? <laughs> we, oh, I think um, if you're applying for a role in design or art, then having a portfolio, I think, is well, you'll not often get asked for one in the application process. And I think, as we said earlier, like having a portfolio is one of those sort of added value or sort of adding another dimension to your application. I mean, it depends on what the application process is. But um, if you if you get an interview and you're like, here's my portfolio, here's some stuff that I've done you're just sort of giving more context and showing a bit more of your stuff so I don't think it's a necessary thing if you haven't got time to put, put, put together a portfolio or maybe you haven't got enough content to even put into a portfolio but I think it depends on the job you're going for but like say it's marketing you could pull together some like social media posts that you've done or you know something that you have found on Instagram that you thought was really cool to do with books and sort of pull together a portfolio and it doesn't have to necessarily be your own work it could be like showing your research that you can get creative with it I think it's just how you want to show your show your stuff 
so it's okay I think it's a case by case it's hard to answer that with like a blanket answer I think but it is a good way of demonstrating your skills that maybe you couldn't just get across in a cover letter in a CV and um yeah and we're, we're getting some more great questions through um we, we'll probably wrap up in the next five minutes or so um if we can because I've just realized the time but uh but yeah thanks for all your engagement so far to the, the panelists and the attendees it's been really interesting uh so I've got a quick question here on um can an individual change the department within the publishing industry after one year um yeah do you have thoughts on that Kelly um yeah so it happens fair bit we I think publishers are quite good at promoting talent internally I think that's something that we've got yeah we've we've, we've well focused on in terms of like developing staff and you know promoting from within so yeah I, I, you can move with within departments internally. For us, you have to go, you still have to go through an application and interview process, but obviously because you're internal, you've kind of got a bit of an edge because you know the business, you can reach out to people in that team, sort of find out more about the role and you've got you've got a bit of an advantage to people who are coming from outside the business. So yeah, it can be done, but you have to sort of put the work in, put in your research, you probably would have to interview, um, but yeah, you can. And, um... Avril, I wondered if I could put this one to you. Someone's asked, um, how should you approach applications for companies that produce manuals, instructional materials and things that you wouldn't necessarily get enjoyment from reading? Okay, well, I, I would wonder whether you would have enjoyment from your job then and, and why you would be applying to that, that company. Um, although that said, um, you know, we don't always get to read everything that we enjoy uh, as a publisher. Um, so two things there, ask yourself the question, if that's all you were going to do day in, day out, um, would you enjoy your job? Um, and secondly, then um, think about it very carefully, because um, this, this question seems to be thinking about editorial and just having an understanding that in editorial, um, you don't always get to read what you want to read or what you like to read, if that makes sense. And should uh, another, yeah, another question, if I could start with you actually, Avril, um, should our CV be a straightforward black ink PDF document or do CVs with color and a creative layout? Are they appreciated? Okay, I think I'm gonna get found out here now because <laughs> Julia and Kali might contradict me, but what I always say is whatever you're attempting to do, do it well. And a simple document executed with um, accurate uh, spelling and grammar and consistent um, legible layout is more important than a whizzy CV that has a number of inaccuracies and actually doesn't allow the reader to get to the critical points. Uh, Julia, what, what would you add to this? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, maybe it would be more, um, it would might have more impact in if you were going for a role in design or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't say that, I mean, you know, it may, may make more impact when you're looking at it, but yeah, exactly what Avril said, you know, is it needs to be accurate and um, I think, you know, using jazzy colours, um, if it's got mistakes or whatever it is, then um, it's not going to cover that up. Ali, what are your thoughts? I think, I mean, I agree. Yeah, you don't want to make sure it's accurate. And I think the most important thing is that it, it's, it's easy for the person reading it to pick out the key information and what skills you're trying to get across and, you know, why you're applying for whatever job you're applying for. I think if it's, it doesn't bother me if it's got like a bit of colour on it or you've used a cool format. Like I know people use Canva to build their CVs. And as long as it's, I can read the sections, I can see your experience and I haven't got to sort of like wade through pictures to figure out when you're, what work experience you've got um then i think i think just what how you go this is a representation of you in a sense i don't think it has to just be black and white i think if you want to add a bit of color i don't like it when people put pictures on their cv because one it's not very inclusive because you don't like you know what i mean you could like filter yourself in or out based on people's unconscious biases and like that so i think pictures are a bit of a like a picture of you is a bit of a no-no and a bit old-fashioned but i think adding like a border is there's no harm in it if you feel feel like it and 
I think this is the last question we've got, um, which is, I'm unsure what level of entry I should be applying for. I have five years ex freelance copy editing experience with a well-known academic publisher. I am unsure if I should be aiming at higher than entry level. Uh, yeah, Callie, what are your thoughts? I think five years, you say copy editing? Yes. I think you could probably look at editor level if you've got five years editorial experience. I think it, it depends on the role. Like if you were going for something in trade, but you've only got academic experience, then maybe it's an assistant editor because you need to build knowledge of that area of publishing. But if you were looking at academic publishing, then I think you could probably look at editor. We call them product managers, I think, in HarperCollins. They use their own titles because why not? Um, yeah, I would say five years editor, maybe even senior editor if you're really good. <laughs> Julia, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I would agree. Uh, I mean, I think it would depend on, on the type of role, but um, yeah, I would agree with what Callie said, yeah. Right. Avril, any thoughts on this? Or? Yeah, I would uh, absolutely agree. And, and again, I think this is an example of, of confidence. It sounds like you have a lot of experience, especially academic publishers. Um, are very attentive to the detail. Uh, I think you could carry that through to trade publishing as well. Um, and I would suggest you review a wide number of jobs and then see and uh, evaluate your own skill set against that. Right. And I've just seen we've just got two questions. And so I'll just go to one panelist each. And um, so we've got one um, that says, I've been thinking about the publishing industry internationally. I think it would be great to work in the industry abroad. How would I go about trying to find a job in a publishing house after my MA in Canada, for example? Uh, Callie, did you have thoughts on this? Um, I mean, a lot of the big publishers will have offices um, internationally. We've got offices in Canada and the US, um, I'm sure, and Penguin and the other sort of bigger, I'm sure, do as well. So I think look on the rather than harpercollins.co.uk, harpercollins.com, and then go to the international section, you should be able to see a list of the offices. And similarly for other publishers, it's probably quite Googleable, if that's a word. Um, and having a look on LinkedIn as well and searching for jobs by location could be a good shout. But yeah, there's definitely loads out there. Publishing is not central just to the UK. Like there's books flying out everywhere. So yeah, I think it, just a little bit of Googling using LinkedIn and um, maybe seeing if there's trade press in the countries that you're looking to study in or move to. That would be what I would do. And last question is, if your social media skills are weak or you're not a big fan of using social media regularly, which jobs in publishing should you avoid? Um, Julia, did you want to take this one? Um, yeah, I would say if, if, you, if you don't like using social media, um, you know, you're not a fan of using it and you don't have... Uh, the skills then I would say probably avoid marketing and publicity roles because that is a big part of the those roles um yeah those those roles specifically marketing and publicity Avril would you add anything on that no I would agree with with Julia and, and I have to say that you know, normally what happens is when people get a job in publishing they tend to um, forget a little bit about their social media because it served its purpose. So don't feel you have to continue with it um, if that's not something, as I said earlier, treat it as a strategic um, uh, tool in your uh, job application um, toolbox, if you like, and, and decide to dispense with it when, when it's no longer needed. Great. And yeah, I think we've now come to the end of our, our event. Um, and it's it's been so interesting. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and what I yeah what I'd like to do is just ask each panelist to just sort of come up with one thing um, if they could sort of summarise their you know advice from today. Um, some of the things that I think are really interesting are the um, the proof statements. You know, so having that in your arsenal already, so you have the confidence and the um, yeah you you have it so that you can um, just go to publishers and. Uh, interviews and applications and um, it will I think hopefully instill you with confidence and then we've got the three C's that became the four C's which is the capability curiosity competency confidence um, and um, remembering organizations like Society of Young Publishers um, the bookseller morning briefing and the um, student um, 
discount that we have, but um, I will just get up the code for that again. Uh, and yeah, and I think there's just been some really, um, really useful advice. Um, so the code for the bookseller is student deal in capitals, which means you can get a 39 pound full year subscription. Um, yeah, so Julia, could I start with you? Um, what, what's the one thing you want um, attendees to come away with today? Um, I, I mean, maybe if I could say two things, but um, uh, I would say get, get online and just really just go to, yeah, the, the bookseller, as you say, Society of Young Publishers, IPG, um, Eventbrite, if you go on Eventbrite and Google, uh, not Google, and yeah, search for publishing events, there's lots of publishing events on there, um, use the internet because uh, there's, there's so much stuff on there that you can research. And then I also just wanted to mention as well for anybody that, um, you know, I know that we're talking to MA students, but also for any um, people that aren't doing an MA that are really interested in getting into publishing and they're, you know, they're not, um, they don't have uh, experience. There are apprenticeships available now as well. So LDN um, have a website, there's a publishing apprenticeship available. Um, that's something that we offer and that's sort of, you know, for people not taking the traditional route into publishing. So I'd really encourage anyone on the call today that's not uh, doing an MA to have a look into that because that's um, a really exciting new uh, programme. And Avril, um, what, what would you like to uh, summarise from today's session or are, are there any um, resources or websites that you'd, you'd like to add that you, you think are useful? I think there's lots of um, resources that have been mentioned today. Um, we've talked about SYPs uh, and we've, I think, uh, also mentioned publishing posts. There's um, book careers as well. Um, there's lots of publishers that are providing um, a huge amount of resource and publishing membership organisations. And I'd suggest that people start to think about that as well, because like yourselves, um, those those organizations wealth of resources there but I did have three things if that's okay I just wanted to say and I'll do that really quickly so the first one is to just to re reiterate my point don't close that door on yourself um, get imposter syndrome and, and push it out of the way um, because we all feel it and we have to overcome it um, build your community and find your tribe um, because that will help you with all those networking things and, and increase your confidence as well. And then um, because a lot of the attendees today are thinking or maybe engaged with um, their uh, masters or maybe have just graduated, uh, remember that there's still a lot of support that your university will be able to provide you with. Um, you, just because you graduate doesn't mean that you cease to be connected with your university and even as alumni um, there are resources that you can tap into. So get that support uh, and um, it should help you too. And good luck everyone and good luck. That's a very good point. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Callie, what are your, your parting thoughts? Um, I think it's coming back to one of the first things we talked about is just like be, it is competitive out there at the moment for entry level jobs. So do try and get a bit creative with your job application. If you can add another angle, a new dimension, maybe it's a link, maybe it's a social media account, maybe it's a blog, maybe it's a portfolio. If you can get something in there that's gonna make you stand out, then do it because it, it will pay off. And also it may, it may take, you know, two, three, five, ten 10 applications before you start getting interviews. Um, just don't get disheartened, it's not personal. Just keep going like it is an industry where you, you kind of have to persevere and, and, and just don't let you know power through kind of thing until you maybe you'll start getting but because through that you hopefully get feedback and then the interviews will start coming in but yeah you have to persevere at the moment but it will pay off the people who are really passionate end up working in books so I assure you great thank you so much and actually on one of those last points I'd add if you're ever offered feedback make make sure you take it because it's really useful um, or, you know, if you're not offered, try and try and ask for it in case. Uh, but thank you so much for my amazing panellists. Um, so we've had Callie Simmons, Avril Gray, Julia Thompson. Um, I would recommend that you um, check out those, uh, their, their companies. Um, so that's uh, at Edinburgh Nap Napier University and um, Bloomsbury and um, HarperCollins and uh, also Inspired Selection. 
Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your for your time and your amazing insights. I've had a really great time. And um, thank you for your questions, everybody. And yeah, good luck. Goodbye from me. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good luck. Good luck. Bye.